the day has finally come where I talk about the largest moon of Neptune, Triton, and the potential for life on this incredible world. I know at least one of you out there is very excited for this video because you have constantly commented and asked for this video, and I hope that I do it justice. So in this video, I will be talking about what Triton is, why we care about it and would like to go do a mission there, as opposed to other moons like Europa and Celadus and all the you know, front page moons, and about its habitability, specifically how it is heated, its surface and geology, its atmosphere and atmosphere surface interactions, its potential for a subsurface ocean, and its potential for water rock interactions, which are key for habitability. And I'll finish out the video by talking about some of the goals that we might aim to achieve in a future Triton mission. Now, what is Triton? Well, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, it's the largest moon of Neptune, and it's the only large moon in our solar system that orbits the opposite direction of its planet's rotation. In other words, retrograde. This is largely because it is a Kuiper Belt object that was captured by Neptune's gravity millions of years ago. And for this reason, it shares many similarities with Pluto, which is also a Kuiper Belt object. Why do we care about Triton and why would we explore it? Well, it has the potential for an ocean, a subsurface ocean, just like Europa, Enceladus, Titan, all of those front page moons I was talking about earlier. And not only does it have the potential for a subsurface liquid water ocean, but also its large orbital inclination, meaning its large angle at which it orbits Neptune compared to the horizontal plane at which Neptune revolves around the sun, is thought to generate a lot of heat on Triton that would maintain a potential ocean because of what's called obliquity tides or obliquity tidal stress. Tidal stress is something I talk about in a, a bunch of my other astrobiology videos or planetary videos because Europa, Titan, Enceladus, Io, those are all moons that I've talked about and they are also tidally heated, meaning that they are stretched and pulled by the enormous gravity of their planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Neptune does the same thing to Triton, but instead of this stress being exacerbated by an elliptical orbit like it is for these other moons that are tidally stressed, the orbit of Triton is actually relatively circular, but because it's so tilted or it has such a high inclination and obliquity, the stress it's put under as it orbits Neptune and Neptune's enormous gravity pulls on it is exacerbated for this reason. So it's heated by what's called obliquity tides. It also has extremely unusual surface geology, which may be the product of cryovolcanism. Now I talk about cryovolcanism also in those other videos. I'm not trying to like push you to the other videos, so I'm sorry I keep talking about this, but I want to mention that when I talk about it in the other videos about the other moons, it's slightly different, or at least maybe not the fundamental processes behind the cryovolcanism, but the surface features that it creates on Triton are incredibly unique in the solar system. And so there's some sort of process, some sort of geologic process going on or processes going on on Triton that are very different from anywhere else in the solar system, making it incredibly unique and very interesting. These landforms on Triton that aren't found anywhere else on the solar system were first revealed by Voyager and have been continuously observed by Earth-based telescopes, and exploring Triton would also provide a better understanding of the evolution of dwarf planets that are tidally activated by giant planets like Neptune, and so it's applicable to those types of systems as well as potentially habitable, which makes it a win-win scenario when we're thinking of where to explore next. Now, I mentioned Triton's geologic features, which are very much unique, so we'll get to those in a second. But just the pure fact that it is geologically active already puts it in a high class of very exciting moons that are also geologically active, including Io, the volcanic moon of Jupiter that I talk about in many videos, and Europa, Enceladus, and Titan, which are also ice-covered worlds with subsurface oceans. But out of all of these moons, other than Io, which is hot with a bunch of volcanism, Triton may actually have the youngest surface. Crater counts suggest that Triton's surface is less than 100 million years old, potentially even only 10 million years old. But tidal heating that would have resulted from its capture event when it was captured by Neptune's gravity and started orbiting it would likely not explain its current or very young geologic activity because we don't think that the capture event was recent. So what does heat Triton? Well, other than capture, which 
would have provided substantial heating that could have lasted a long time, but would have probably been waning by now. There's also probably lots of ammonia on and in Triton that may contribute to maintaining a potential subsurface liquid ocean because it decreases the melting point. However, even in the absence of antifreeze agents such as ammonia and tidal heating, radiogenic heating from the radioactive decay of isotopes, which happens on every world, could actually provide sufficient heat to maintain a liquid water ocean in Triton for over 4.5 billion years. So we might not even need to implicate other heating sources considering the power that radiogenic heating has. However, obliquity tides, as I mentioned earlier, likely contribute to providing heat and maintaining that ocean, as well as providing enough heat to cause geologic activity that has erased a bunch of craters on its surface and led to a very young surface. Now, it's important to note that there are some processes that are occurring on Triton's surface that may cause some of the geologic features we see. In other words, they don't necessarily implicate indigenic or interior to exterior processes like cryovolcanism, but there are many features that do seem to indicate that indigenic processes like extrusion of viscous fluids during cryovolcanism is occurring on Triton. Now, I'm not going to mention all the geologic features we see on Triton that indicate indigenic activity, but I will mention a few of my favorites, the first being Patere. Now, if you've seen my Lava Lakes on Io video, you know that Patere on Io are kind of analogous to calderas on Earth. However, these features don't require the volcanism to be high temperature. On Triton, Patere are also present due to potentially cryovolcanism. Some other geologic features on Triton include pitted cones, which are basically small conical hills that have pits in their summits. And what does this sound like? Well, it sounds like a volcano. <laughs> and the last and potentially my favorite type of geologic feature or terrain on Triton is cantaloupe terrain, which is exactly what it sounds like. It looks just like cantaloupe, guys. Look at this comparison. <laughs> and what it is is just quasi-circular, closely spaced, shallow depressions with slightly raised rims. And just to give you an idea of the scale of these depressions that in large numbers make up the cantaloupe terrain, they are 25 to 35 kilometers in diameter. So just one makes up a very large area. So this cantaloupe terrain is very widespread on Triton's surface. And its origins is still uncertain, but we think it's potentially formed from the upwelling of subsurface material. And <laughs> this explanation is already very broad and vague in itself. So we need to get out there and do some looking of Triton because we don't know enough about these really, really awesome geologic features. I mean, cantaloupe terrain. Like, would you have ever imagined anything like that in our solar system. Now, diapirism is one of the ways in which some of these indigenic features may form, and this just means material from the ice shell ocean interface is brought up to the shallow crust, either due to thermal or compositional variations in Triton's crust, and then pressurization and faulting may cause the eruption of some of this material onto the surface. The patterns of tectonic features on Triton's surface can be used to identify the stress environment in which they formed. For example, much of the features on Triton's surface are due to extensional stress or stretching of the surface rather than compressing it. And these stress mechanisms can occur locally, regionally, or globally based on the great length of ridges or extensional features on Triton's surface. It suggests that it's global scale extensional stress that's going on, potentially or probably due to obliquity tides, at least in part, and also potentially due to non-synchronous rotation. Now, non-synchronous rotation means that the ice shell might be decoupled from the moon's interior because of a liquid water ocean in between the shell and the interior, which might cause the ice shell to rotate non-synchronously with the interior. Now, this is something that we think is likely on Europa because of these large concentric ridge features that we see at Europa's surface, but non-synchronous rotation has not been confirmed on Triton. And the distribution of Triton's ridges has not indicated any correlation with global stress mechanisms, but we should also also note here that only 40% of Triton has been imaged, so we need to do global imaging before we can really pick out any global trends that are going on. 
This is another reason why a future dedicated Triton mission is so important. Moving on now from Triton's surface and geology to its atmosphere and kind of getting to the stuff that Triton contains or its composition, which based on spectroscopic observations, Triton has a thin nitrogen dominated atmosphere. Our own atmosphere is dominated by nitrogen, but it gets very different when we look at the other things that Triton's atmosphere contains and does not contain. For example, water and CO2 have been observed on Triton, but at these outer solar system temperatures, these things behave as bedrock. So just imagine a surface of water ice and dry ice. Volatile ices of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane seasonally migrate across the surface. In other words, because they're volatile and susceptible to sublimation and refreezing, they can migrate seasonally along the surface, which creates not only variation of surface features that we observe over time, but also variation in atmospheric pressure. Hydrogen cyanide and ethane have also tentatively been observed on Triton, potentially as a result of photochemistry. In other words, the breakdown of other compounds to create such compounds on Triton. And you may have noticed in the geological or geomorphological figure here of Triton, that there is this major ice cap at its south pole. Now, that is because nitrogen sublimates and condenses seasonally, forming seasonal polar caps. This extensive south polar cap, which consists mostly of nitrogen, was observed by Voyager and Earth-based observations, but it hasn't been stable over time. Changes in the extent of the south polar cap due to exchange with the atmosphere and vice versa have caused changes in atmospheric pressure since Voyager. Voyager's images also showed discontinuous stretches of haze, again a very vague term that we're using here, and we're not sure why this haze is there and what has caused it. One hypothesis is that the potential ethane and hydrogen cyanide could seed production of hydrocarbon ice particulates in the atmosphere which would eventually precipitate onto the surface, but it's also been proposed that the haze could be submicron nitrogen ice particulates instead of hydrocarbon ice particulates coming from seasonal sublimation of the nitrogen ices and or plume activity. Wind on Titan is driven by the release of gas from polar ice sublimation as well as potentially plumes, and the evidence for wind direction is given to us by the orientation of fan-shaped deposits, plumes, and even potential dunes. If dunes like those on Pluto are confirmed on Triton, their geological context can provide us clues in terms of the relative ages of geologic events and processes on Triton's surface. But finding evidence for such landforms on Triton requires extremely high resolution imaging, again requiring a future dedicated Triton mission. Now moving on to potentially the most exciting part of Triton, its potential ocean. The major lines of evidence for Triton's ocean include its young surface, its ongoing geologic activity, its differentiated interior, and the fact that it is tidally and radioactively heated, which could lead to the maintenance of a subsurface liquid water ocean. Now, why do we think that Triton's interior is differentiated into a rocky core and an outer ice shell and potentially water ocean in between those two? Well, the extreme heating upon capture of Triton would have allowed enough heat to differentiate Triton's interior into different layers. And then after that, heat sources like tidal heating from capture, radiogenic heating, antifreeze agents like ammonia and obliquity tides would allow enough heat to maintain this ocean. But the really important thing here about the rocky interior, rocky mantle, is that if it interacts with the ocean, the liquid water, that could be a source of energy for life. Because when water and rock interact, a bunch of different compounds form, which life could then harness the reactions between those compounds to gain energy. And confirming that Triton has a liquid water ocean, especially if we confirm that it also has water rock interactions at the seafloor of that ocean, that confirmation would expand our idea of the habitable zone, which we used to think was just dependent on the distance of a planet from its sun. But now we know that all of these outer solar system large planet moon systems have the potential to be habitable because they are heated not from solar radiation, or at least not solely from solar radiation, but also from immense tidal stress. 
And Triton's young age implies a highly dynamic environment with surface atmosphere volatile exchange and potentially even drastic seasonal climate change. Also, the presence of methane in Triton's atmosphere makes higher order organics possible, just like on Titan. Titan is a large moon of Saturn that is extremely methane rich, and I have a whole video about it that I'll link up to the top right for you, but basically because of the breakdown of methane in its atmosphere, it produces other higher order organic molecules, and that process could be occurring on Triton. And the presence of such organic material on Triton would greatly increase its habitability, especially if those materials came in contact with liquid water. Models predict that Triton's ice shell is around 150 kilometers thick, as is its ocean. And the composition of its ocean is basically dependent on its volatile composition, which is expected to be comet-like. And the average comet volatile composition suggests that the ocean on Triton would be very rich in ammonia, like we talked about earlier, sodium bicarbonate, and chloride. And this ocean material may be brought to the surface from processes like convective upwelling, tectonics, and or impact fracturing. And so with all this information about Triton's surface, its geology, its atmosphere, and its potential ocean in mind, what would our goals be for a future Triton mission? Well, we would want to do a flyby of Triton to determine whether it has a subsurface ocean, why it has the youngest surface of any icy world in our solar system, the processes responsible for this young surface, the nature of Triton's plumes and their energy source, and the internal state and thermal history of Triton. But this kind of a mission would also allow for opportunistic Neptune science, as well as answering these questions about Triton. And it's also applicable to studying Pluto because of their great similarities, as well as other Kuiper Belt objects, and just increasing our overall understanding of early solar system history because of this Kuiper Belt origin it has. And it's also applicable to other ocean worlds. And again, it would also greatly expand our idea of the zone of habitability in a solar system, which has now pretty much gone from first little band to pretty much the entire solar system, which is pretty freaking cool. So if you guys want to check out any of my other planetary astrobiology type videos, I will link the playlist up here for you. And if you want to check out my first Europa video, that is the one where I kind of go over what habitability really means and what a planet or moon has to have to be habitable and why Europa has that, as well as potentially these other icy ocean worlds that I talked about today. And as always, you can find my references linked in the description box below. I put numbers on a bunch of of the points that I made on the slides today. So look for those numbers to see which reference you want to check out in the description box if you're interested. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.